All right. Amen. Uh, keep your place there in Mark chapter 4, but go to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter number 8. Now, the title of the sermon this evening is, Does Seed Need a Sower? Does seed need a sower? In other words, does the Word of God need to be preached, need to be communicated to someone in order for them to be saved? That's what we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, you know, I've, I've heard this a lot lately, out soul winning, you know, oh, I'm good. I've got a Bible inside. I, I can, I'll figure it out. You know, I, don't worry. I'll, I'll look it up. I'll look it up tonight. I, I don't need to hear this right now. Um, or, or I hear this one also every once in a while. Well, I know a missionary. I know an evangelist. I know somebody who just picked up the Bible one night in a hotel room about ready to commit suicide and they got born again. They got saved. Uh, you know, whatever the case is, or, you know, uh, I, I left a track on someone's door and then five years later they came to church and they said that they read that five years after I left it on their door and then they just got born again and came to church and now they're a great disciple. We're going to see in the Bible if that's true, okay? Now, before I even start, I mean, just, just, just hold this picture in your mind. Let's say I've got a bag of seeds up here, all right? Whatever seeds they're for. And I've got a pot with dirt in it. What are the odds that those seeds are going to jump up and go into that pot? I mean, I think we can all agree here that those seeds need to be planted in order for them to have the opportunity or the chance to grow, right? right. Okay, just think about that. So we're going to come back to Mark 4, but I want you to look at the parallel passage here in Luke chapter number 8. Look at verse number 4. So this is obviously the same parable here where we're, we're not going to go through the whole parable, but I want to pull some principles that Jesus taught about the parable of the sower. Look at verse number four. It says this, and when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. Now, remember, nothing is in the Bible by coincidence. The Bible does not use filler words. The Bible does not uh, just try to, to take up your time for any such reasons that so when you read in the beginning of this verse here and it says, and when much people were gathered, we need to pay attention to that. Why does it tell us that? What does that mean? So you have to understand that Jesus here is about to teach a truth to his disciples and prove a point in front of much people that guess what? Seed needs a sower. Okay. And we'll revisit that here in a moment, but look at verse number five. It says, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And then he goes on and gives the parable, okay? But in, an important part there, it says, a sower went out to sow his seed. Everybody, everybody follow me there, right? Uh, what's a sower? A sower is somebody who takes seed and plants it, sows it, in hopes that it will yield fruit, okay? And like we all already established, seed does not typically jump out of pouches or, you know, leave the ground and, and go and plant themselves. Okay? Everybody got me? Look at verse 10. Skip down to verse number 10. So we've established this truth. The sower went out to sow. Look at verse 10. It says this. Okay, after the disciples ask him, hey, what do these things mean? Why do you speak to them in parables? Verse 10, he says, and he said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God but to others in parables that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. So if it's, if it's possible that this group of people here that are without, now go back to Mark chapter four, that are without, that are not saved. If it's impossible for them to really understand these parables and to actually get the truth that Jesus is trying to teach them, what are the odds of them picking up the Bible or the word of God and reading it in an unsaved state and getting the message? Okay. What are the odds that this Bible just does this, calls an Uber, and goes to the nearest subdivision and starts preaching itself? <laughs> Not very good. Okay. Mark chapter 4, look at verse number 10. It says, And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked him of the parable. So we already talked about that. Verse 11. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. That's very important. We're going to revisit that here in a moment. So we need to understand that to the unsaved person, the kingdom of God and the way into the kingdom of God is a mystery. Okay. But he says this, but unto them that are without, those are people who are without the kingdom, outside of the kingdom of God. 
those that are not saved, it says, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. Now, you could preach an entire series off of this verse here. This proves so much. This proves that not everyone can be saved. Obviously, there are people who have pushed God too far. And God says, you know what? I'm drawing a line in the sand. You're done. You're rejected. You're reprobate concerning the faith. Have a good night. Enjoy hell. Okay? I mean, this doesn't say all that, but that's pretty much what it means. <laughs> all right, look at verse number 12. It says this, that seeing they may see and not perceive. And I want you to understand that this is what happens when the unsaved pick up the Bible. They cannot perceive. Okay? So he says that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. So we can also establish that a person has to perceive and understand this mystery in order to get into the kingdom of God, in order to be born again, right? Everybody follow me. Everybody understands. Verse 13, and he said unto them, know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? Look, this is very, very important for us to understand if we're going to understand the other parables that are in the Bible. In fact, if we're just going to understand Bible doctrine, period. All right. Now, look at verse number 14. The sower soweth the word. Go back to Luke chapter 8 real quick. The sower soweth the word. So when the disciples ask him, hey, what do these things mean? Why? What is the seed likened unto? What is that illustrating? What does Jesus say? That that is the word of God. Very important. If you don't believe me, here it is again. Luke chapter 8, look at verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. So the sower <laughs> sows the seed. The sower <laughs> sows the word of God. So what does that tell us? Well, if seed needs a sower in order for it to produce, in order for it to have the opportunity to grow into a tree, into bloom, and to produce fruit, and so on and so forth, well, then guess what? The Word of God, which is the seed, needs a preacher. Okay? You have to understand this. Now turn to Matthew chapter 10. This is not negotiable. This is not optional. This is what the Bible teaches. And remember, the Bible said in Luke chapter 8, verse 4, when much people were gathered together, that's when Jesus decides, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and communicate this truth to the masses. Now, they didn't get the parable because they're not saved, and even the disciples didn't understand, but he said, hey, I'm going to explain this to you anyways. And then after he explains that, guess what? They understood that because they're saved. They have the, they have the Lord there to explain these things to him, but the fact remains if seed needs a sower in order for it to produce, then the Word of God needs preachers in order for it to produce. You would, be, you would be amazed and shocked if you could go to a lot of these other churches that are around the country today and just listen at the way that they do evangelism. I mean, they just, it really is like they just think that people get saved by osmosis. You know, unless you're a Calvinist and you think, well, God just selects people, you know, but not everybody's a Calvinist. You know, and when we knock on people's doors, do you know what they do? They say, oh, well, you're just like going above and beyond. Like, like you actually go out and preach the, the Bible? Like, oh, I could never do that. Man, that's crazy. Are you doing this because you want to be like some super soldier? You want to be some kind of a super Christian? It's like, no, this is basic Bible doctrine, yeah. <laughs> right? The sower needs to sow the seed. The word of God has to be preached. Amen. We don't do it to get super duper extra rewards and so that we can be lifted up on high. It's because if we don't do it, guess what? Reprobates will explode inside of this nation. And then the next thing you know, we're going to have the problem. Oh, wait, we're going to have the problems that we see today going on. You understand? It's not that hard to understand. Now, look at verse number 27, Matthew chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus says this, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. So he's not saying like, hey, when I whisper in your ear over here in our little, you know, dark room. That, no, that's not what he's talking about. He's saying, hey, these dark sayings and these parables and these things that are hard to understand that the world doesn't get, I want you who now understand these things to speak those to people and make that light bulb go off in their head so that they understand this. Okay. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. So in other words, also don't hide the truth from people. Buy the truth and sell it not. Okay. And what ye hear in the ear 
that preach ye upon the housetops. If it was sufficient for just written communication, just the Bible, just tracts, then why in the world do we need to go out and preach the, God, the, word, the, the word of God? It doesn't make any sense, okay? We have to be a people that knows why we do what we do. Okay, and like I said, it's not so that we can, you know, just be super soldiers. It's because we need to do it. The kingdom of God depends on us going out and sowing the seed, which is what? It's the word of God. But again, a lot of people do not understand this or worse yet, don't even believe this. Now, look, I will tell you, I've had, you know, old IFB pastors that believed wholeheartedly, you know, you just give somebody a Bible and they could open it up and figure it all out by themselves. Okay. And they're saved. Okay. It is what it is. So I'm not saying that these people that, that all these people that say that are reprobates, right? Because there are some guys out there that go soul winning and, you know, do, do good stuff. And you know what? They, they believe that, but they're wrong. Okay. They're absolutely wrong. And, and to be honest with you, in a lot of those churches, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find a lot of complacency. That's really what that doctrine breeds. It breeds complacency because it's like, well, they don't really need me. They don't really need our efforts. If we can't go today because it's raining or because it's snowing or whatever the case is, then it's okay because they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. No, that is not the way we need to do business here. Now, real quickly, go back to Mark chapter 4. And I want to show you something else from verse 11. So what I tell you in darkness that speak ye in light. So we're, we, you know, we're, we're called to be transparent with the message of God, right? This is why we put our stuff on YouTube and Facebook and any avenue that we can get our hands on is because we want to take the dark sayings of the Bible, the things that don't make sense. And we want to make them light. But also, we don't want to be perceived as hiding anything. You know, you go to a Jehovah Witness Kingdom Hall, and guess what? There's no windows on their buildings. Why is that? Are they obeying this verse? Absolutely not. They're not obeying this verse. They say, hey, what we tell you, what the Watchtower tells you in darkness, keep it in darkness. Bring people in here, right? We'll dim the lights a little bit, and we'll really give them some business. That's how they operate. That's what they do. And, you know, going back just real quick, quick disclaimer, you know, people say, well, if, if you're saying you got to preach the word of God audibly, then how do deaf people get saved? I don't have time to get into that tonight, but they can be saved. Okay. You can, can, let me just ask you this question. Can, is it possible to communicate the gospel to a deaf person? Yes, it is. There you go. So like I said, I don't have time to get into that one. We will do that another day, but look at verse number 11. It says this. And he said unto them. Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. So again, why can't someone just pick up the Bible and get saved? Why can't the seed just plant itself? And I know this sounds ridiculous, but like I've already established, I've already told you there are so many people today that believe the contrary. They believe that the seed can sow itself. They believe that an unsaved person could just open the Bible and learn the way of salvation. You know what happens more often than not, though? Is that somebody goes and preaches the gospel to them, or they get a seed planted from Sunday school or something, okay? Some kind of a church service, a relative, and then they ponder on it, and they think about it for a while. And then one night, they do pick up the Bible, and they say, you know what? I'm going to get saved. And then they just attribute that to the Bible. But somebody, but they never want to bring up the fact that somebody actually took them aside and said, hey, are you 100% sure if you died today that you'd go to heaven? I mean, do you, I mean, look, it's not like we go and knock on people's door and we give them the gospel and they've got like, a, you got like a three minute window to pray or the devil's going to take that seed and you're done, right? We can't see the spiritual. Now, sometimes that's the case. Other times that seed, it goes in there and it stays there. They just need to ponder it. They just need to think about it. And sometimes people just need to hear it multiple times in order for them to get saved. But what I want to establish right here is this answer to the question, why can't someone just pick up the Bible and get saved? Very clearly here, verse 11, and he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, because it's a mystery. Okay, look, you can, you can be unsaved and you can pick up, you know, the Bible and, and turn to Romans, you know, and, and read through Romans, or you could read through John and, and see all the times where it says, believe, believe, believe. But you know what? Eventually you're gonna get to James where it says faith without works is dead. And then you're gonna get confused. I mean, look, this, we have evidence of this. I mean, we go soul winning every single week, right? Multiple times a week. 
And we talk to these people, and, and you know what they do? They all oppose themselves. Oh, it's, it's a free gift. You're right. But if you don't have the works, you're not saved, and you're going to hell. You see, they cannot divide the word of truth because they don't have the spirit, and we'll get into that. Now go to Ephesians chapter number one. Ephesians chapter number one. So again, why can't the seed plant itself? Why can't somebody just pick up the Bible, <coughs> read it, figure it out, and be like, I'm good, I'm born again, I'm saved. It's a done deal, no questions asked, I got it. I'm super smart, I'm the best, I'm better than you, and I'm better than the rest. <laughs> okay? Well, because it's a mystery. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse number 9. Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse number 9. It says this, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Now, let me ask you a question. Why is this verse in the Bible? So that you can understand that, that God's will is a mystery. Well, what's God's will? John 6, 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. It's the will of the Father that everybody who sees Jesus Christ, meaning, you know, gets the gospel preached to them, and they can perceive, and they can understand, it's God's will that that person would make the right choice, use that measure of faith that God has given them, and make Christ the object of their faith. That is his will. But you know what? It's a mystery to the unsaved person. And that's why Paul says this here. He says, having made known unto us, who are the us? Those who are already saved. He's talking to the Ephesians the body of Christ, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. So if it's a mystery, what are the odds of some unsaved person picking up the word, picking up the seed, and getting himself saved? Why? How? These are the questions that people do not want to answer. Because you see, it's easy for the dead as a doornail church, right? Right? to say, well, they'll figure it out. Well, they have Moses and the prophets. They have the Bible. They can figure it out. And I've heard preachers say this. Well, we live in America. There's a Bible on every corner. Yeah, is there a King James Bible on every corner? Let's, let's, how about we start with that? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, <laughs> but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. How about that? How about that for your seed, huh? But they don't want to talk about that, do they? Instead, they want to justify playing reindeer games during Sunday morning service and having the big screen behind them and the Pac-Man background and all the instruments. All the while, people are dying and going to hell. And then we go out there and we knock on the door and they got the Trump flag and they're for freedom, right? They're on for freedom, right? And then we knock on the door. Hey, I've got the right for you to never come here again. That's the attitude of most of these pet parasitic patriots that are around here today. Yeah, and then they're wondering, well, why is the country going to hell, huh? Why, why, why? Well, it's because of you. That's why. It's because of your liberal church. That's why. Anyways, I got to figure out what the heck I'm talking about here. All right, go to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter number 3. Ephesians chapter number 3. So right after chapter 2. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, we use that out soul winning. So what, what's the chapter largely about? It's about Jesus Christ. It's about salvation by grace through faith. Free gift. No works involved. The last part of the chapter talks about the foundation being Christ, which now, once a person has, they can build upon that foundation, which we've talked about extensively in the past. Now, I just want to point some stuff out to you in this chapter here. Verse number 3. So... Basically, off of what I just talked about, off of building upon the foundation, Paul tells the Ephesians this, for this cause, right? For well, what's the cause? What, what's he talking about? Well, what I just mentioned, the foundation. So because we have a foundation, because it needs to be built upon, he says this, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation... He made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. Interesting concept, because Paul was a Pharisee, and Paul knew Scripture, even before he got saved. 
If you were to catch him right before the Damascus Road and say, hey, real quick, what chapter uh, did Moses get the commandments? He would be able to tell you. Well, he wouldn't be able to say the chapter would be saying it was written in this place after, you know. He would communicate it in the way that he knew, right? But he knew the law, did he not? But was he saved? So this is a guy who's studied, who's read, and hadn't figured it out. Kind of interesting. Who had to give him that revelation? Well, he tells you. Jesus Christ. Look at verse number four. He says this, Whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, the mystery of Christ here that he's talking about is not only God's will or the way salvation works. Look, just go soul winning for one day and we'll show you that this is a mystery. Because people go to churches, Baptist churches, I mean, you run into people from even the Treasure Valley Church, Baptist Church, which shouldn't be called Baptist Church, should be called something else. Uh, but I guess I'm a crybaby, right? But we'll talk about that some other time. Um, you know, and, and they can't give us the right answers. So you, you mean to tell me you can go to a church that uses the King James Bible that claims to be right on the gospel, right on doctrine, and they have several, several, several people that haven't figured this mystery out yet? So how much, so, so, so understanding that, what are the odds that some unsaved person down at, you know, Boise State's going to roll out of bed, flip open the Bible, and get the mystery and get saved? Ain't going to happen unless somebody sows some seed. Unless somebody causes them to hear and to perceive the Word of God, to understand these things. Mysteries need to be solved. They need to be explained. And so what Paul is telling the Ephesians, hey, not only do you understand the mystery, but also how it works. And then he's going to explain to them the fellowship between the the Gentiles and the Jews. Now, basically, uh, another part of that mystery is, hey, we're all one in the body of Christ. There's no division. There shouldn't be a church just for Jews and a church for Ephesians, a Korean Baptist church or whatever. We're all one in Christ Jesus. So look at verse number five. He says this, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Interesting. Interesting that it takes the Spirit of God to reveal these things to you. An unsaved person, are they dwelled by the Holy Ghost? No, they are not. So how in the world will they understand this mystery? Guess what? It ain't going to happen. It doesn't work. It's a lie. It's a lie of the devil. Look at verse 7. It says, or verse 6, I'm sorry. It says this that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Pretty self-explanatory there. Look at verse 7. It says this, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Do you see the emphasis here? What is the emphasis placed on? Just, hey, they got Moses and the prophets, man, it's all good. Let them figure it out. No, he's saying, hey, I'm a minister. Christ gave me this ability to communicate this ministry to the unsaved person so that they could be saved. And you do that by preaching. Look, if seed needs a sower, and the word of God is the seed, then the word of God needs preachers. That's how people get saved. This book is not going to preach itself. Not even close. The kingdom of God needs us to do that. Look at verse number, verse number nine, he says this, and to make all men see what is that fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now go to... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. And so he, like I said, he wants them, he wants the Ephesians to understand, hey, guess what? There's no more Jew or Gentile. There's no more any of that stuff in Christ. You're all one. And guess what? That was a mystery to the Jews. That was a mystery to the Gentiles. That was a mystery to the world. And guess what? Unfortunately today, it's still a mystery to a lot of people. They do not get that. Even saved, born again, Bible-believing churches. <laughs> there, there are them out there, and they don't get this mystery. Right? Even if they get the first mystery, God's will. Hey, no works involved. Free gift. Christ paid it all. He did the whole thing. Right? You can get that mystery and still slip up on other things. 
which is why Jesus said, hey, you have got to thoroughly understand this parable that I am telling you right now. Because if you don't, the chances of you understanding the rest of the Bible, the rest of these mysteries is very slim. Now, again, why can't someone just pick up the Bible and get saved? Why can't a bag of seeds just open itself and roll down the street to the nearest farm and plant themselves? Look at verse 14, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Now let's stop right there. Who is the natural man? The unsaved person. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. That's interesting. Neither can he know them because they are what? Spiritually discerned. That's right. Spiritually discerned. So if a person doesn't have the Spirit, if they don't have the new man, can they understand the Word of God? Negative. Because these things are spiritually discerned. The natural man, the person without the new man, ain't going to get it. Not even close. Not happening. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. And the Bible even takes it a step further and says, you know what? It's foolishness to them. So when they open up the Bible, like my dad did several years ago, I can remember this very distinctly. When I was in elementary school, there was a period of probably a couple months where every day before he would go to work and he worked nights, before he would go to work, he would read that black King James Bible that's sitting right over here on this shelf. He would read it, you know, and then one day I noticed he stopped reading it. And I said, well, you're not reading the Bible anymore? And he says, I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense. And don't buy this. Oh, it's the these and the thous and the yees and the yous. No, <laughs> uh -uh. that's not it. They don't understand salvation because it's a mystery, because someone needs to preach that to them. And I couldn't do it at that time. Now I was saved. I was definitely saved. I got saved in a Baptist church, no doubt about it. But I couldn't communicate this to him because I didn't get discipled after that. I continued on for a little while and my parents yanked me out. But it says that it's foolishness to them. They don't get it. It is silly. How could you not have to work? You have to work for everything in life, right? So how are you telling me I don't have to work for my salvation? Don't we hear that every single week? <laughs> That's like the message of the world. That is what they believe. You know, I mean, heck, even when we do preach it to them, a lot of them are like, That's crazy. That's not what the Pope says. That's not what the Quorum of Twelve Apostles said. Hey, that's not what the Watchtower says. Right? Isn't that foolishness unto them, even when they're hearing it? So how much more foolish is, is it gonna be to somebody who's never really audibly even heard this? Go to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter number 16. And like I said, I believe you could give somebody the gospel and you could, you know, preach it to them and they could just go, I don't know, a little while later, be sitting down and be like, you know what, I'm going to read something here. Or maybe they get an, an invite from somebody. If something happens, it puts a Bible in front of them and then read it in full, well knowing the gospel. I believe they can call upon the name of the Lord. But it's not their reading and them figuring out this mystery on their own that did it. It was that seed that you, somebody else planted in them that communicated. Somebody communicated that truth to them and they held on to it. Look, people know, a lot of people that we talk to, they'll repeat the gospel back to us. Right. Say, look, I get it. I know what the Bible says. I'm just not ready to make that decision right now. I mean, and sometimes you can't really blame them because the deception is so strong out there. Right. I mean, they grow up in public school, and then what does, what does the public school say? Hey, you can be anything you want to, right? You're special. If you work, you know, or, or you know, if you work hard, you get, you get rewarded. That's how it is. Not when it comes to salvation, because we're all sinners, and it's too late. Yep. It's a done deal, right? But they hear that. I mean, the heck, the Santa Claus thing, yeah. right? If you're a good boy or a girl, guess what? You're going to get them presents. You know, you're going to get your gift, right? Isn't that what the, the message of Santa Claus is? If you're good, you get the gift. The exact opposite of what the Bible teaches. So you can't really fault them too much for not understanding this. But I'll tell you what, they're sure as heck not going to understand it if they've never heard it and they just pick up the Bible or pick up a track and read it. Right. Ain't going to happen. Seed needs a sower. The Word of God needs preachers. To us, it's a simple doctrine, but to the world and to a lot of these Christian people out here, it's not a simple doctrine. 
because again, the devil loves to come in and take over and play games and try to cloud the minds of people. Luke chapter 16, just really quickly here, look at verse 29. You know the story about the rich man and Lazarus. It says this here, after Lazarus, I'm not Lazarus, but after the rich man's crying out and saying, hey, Abraham, send Lazarus over here to give me some water. You know, let him dip his finger. He's still my servant. <laughs> not quite, but you get the point. You understand the story here. Look what he says. It says this, Abraham, say, or I'm sorry, yeah. It says, Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let him hear them. So Jesus is telling this story here to prove a point, to prove several points, which we don't have time to get into. But verse 29, Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let him hear them. So in this situation here, the rich man's in hell. He's calling out, he's crying out for water because of the flames, because his warm's on fire. He's in torments, right? And then he says, hey, send somebody to tell my brethren, lest they come here also which proves apparently the people in hell don't want other people to go there. Right. Apparently they get the message at that point. Like, hey, uh, this is bad. Uh, tell them to quit, you know, goofing around. Tell them to quit mocking God. And then Abraham says, hey, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. You know, and here's where people will say, okay, we'll see that. That proves it right there. Because when you read Moses, he speaks to you. Well, that's true if you're saved. But even during this time frame, you know, there's other passages in the Bible that say, hey, you know, Moses was read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Yep. That's what he's talking to. He's like, hey, th these guys, your brethren, they know where the truth can be found, right? Because there were still people in the synagogues that were saved, that understood the basic plan of salvation, that you call upon the Lord and that is what saves you. I mean, they had the Psalms, they had the Proverbs, and that's what he's saying. Hey, the truth is not far from every one of us. That is all that's being said here. Verse 31. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And isn't that the truth? Yep. Go to Luke chapter number 24, and I'll just show you an example of this. Look, it's hard for us to understand a lot of the different things that are in the Bible. Peter said it himself that Paul's writings were difficult to understand. He said, hey, there's, some of that stuff's pretty deep. It requires maturity. It requires growth. Well, if that's true for the believer, again, how much more is that true for the unbeliever? So just to show you a quick example of this, of regarding Moses and what is written. So after this resurrection here, after the resurrection, look at what, what can be found in verse 27, Luke 24, 27. So this is when Jesus appears to them and they're like, who is this guy? <laughs> so it says this, and beginning at Moses, so after they, they realize that it's Christ, it says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. <laughs> so he's talking to saved people here. And he still had to expound. He still had to explain the things that were written to save people. You, and don't let anybody tell you, oh, well, they didn't get saved until after the resurrection. We've dealt with that before. We'll deal with it again. That is not true. They were, you think Jesus picked 12 disciples that were not saved when he said, one of you is a devil? Like, good night. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number three. We're getting close to being done here. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. And so that, all I'm trying to tell you is that, look, a lot of these truths and a lot of these mysteries, we have to learn ourselves being saved, having the Spirit. But somebody who doesn't have the Spirit, you expect me to believe? You expect us to believe that they can just pick up this Bible and bam, done deal. <coughs> somebody comes in here and says, hey, I got saved uh, because you left this uh, invite on my door here which just has Bible verses and no explanation. You know why those verses are on our invite? It's just to basically let people know where we stand. <laughs> you know, when you pick up a flyer on someone's door and it's like, faith without works is dead, you got to have the works, here, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you kind of know where they stand, don't you? <laughs> so, and obviously we believe all those verses, but the difference is we can rightly divide those verses. 1 Corinthians 3, look at verse number 4. So Paul says this, he says, for while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Verse 5, who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Interesting that Paul would mention that people believe because of ministers. And guess what? You are all ministers. 
You have the seed. You have the word of God. You have the training. You have the opportunity to go out and preach the gospel. And when you do that, you are sowing seed. You are preaching the word. You are ministering truth to your neighbors in this community. Right? And guess what? Some of those people believe because of you. Because of what you did. And I know some people will be like, you don't save anybody. It's not what Paul said. Yeah, right. Several times. That's, you know what, you know what that attitude is? That's the complacent cafeteria, lukewarm, pot belly pig Christian. That's their attitude. Verse number six, he says this, I have planted. Well, what in the world does that mean? I have planted. Apollos watered. Why does it always go back to farming? Because that's exactly how it's like. The word of God has to have preachers. Sometimes you go out and you plant a seed. Other times somebody's already been there and say, hey, I talked to you last year. And then you get another opportunity to water that. That happens all the time here. So he says this, I have planted. Oh, you mean he planted the word of God? Meaning he preached the word of God? Yes. Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And so you can see this threefold division of how this works. There's seeds that get planted. There's watering that goes on. And God causes that thing to grow. Verse 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. And that's where people like to extract. They like to say, they, they won't read to you the, the, the verses I've already gone over, right? They'll just say, no, 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 it's God that gives the increase. How dare you say that you go out and get people saved? You don't do none of that. Okay, John MacArthur, Paul Washer, how about you shut your mouth, huh? How about that? Verse 8, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And so as a sower is doing labor, so is a preacher preaching. It's labor, it's work. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. Oh, you mean we're on the same team? You mean he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad? Right. Oh, okay, I understand now. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. So it is God's will that we would go out and sow the seed, which is the word of God. Go to Matthew chapter number 21. Matthew chapter number 21. And we will wrap this thing up here. Matthew chapter 21. And I'm going to have you look at verse number 43. So Matthew chapter 21, look at verse 43. It says this, therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now that is also Ephesians chapter three. That is a mystery because during this time, most people thought, and even the disciples were like, man, we're going to set up this physical kingdom. Like right now, Jesus is going to be the king, like right now. Right? And it's going to be like the times of David, and we're going to get our sovereignty back, and we're going to be able to steamroll the world again. He's like, no. He's telling these Pharisees, these unbelieving Jews, he's saying, no, this nation as you know it is done. And guess what a nation consists of? It consists of people. And guess what those people do according to the verse? His nation is going to bring forth fruits. And that is the end game. That is the end goal of why we sow seed right. to bring forth fruits. A nation has people and those people are expected to go out and bring forth fruit to conduct labor. This is not a difficult doctrine to understand, but apparently for a lot of heretics out there, it is. Yeah. And a lot of compromising Christians, it is as well. Right. Jesus said that the word of God is like the seed. And it needs a sower. So if it needs to be sown, then it needs to be preached. You know, your job as a soul winner is not to be taken lightly. No, you don't ever let anybody mock you because of what you do. Or tell you, you know, you don't need to do that. You don't need to go knock on people's doors. I've heard Baptists say this. You don't need to be, going, you don't need to be a jerk and go knock on someone's door and browbeat them with the Bible. 
You just need to make a friend and then you bring them to church. Which is it? <laughs> I don't need to knock on the door and tell them that, but I need to knock on the door to be friends. That's why they have soul winning and tracting times. A lot of churches soul winning program is simply that. You go out into the community and you make a friend. Look, I ain't got no problems making friends, but look, I'd rather just give you the gospel and hopefully get you saved and see what happens than, than to, to, to be friends some a bunch of heathens hoping and begging them and pleading with them. Oh, please come to church. Please, 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 please. No, who's got time for that? What if they get ran over by a car tomorrow? Right. Nobody knows what the future holds. Right. So we need to preach now. We need to preach right now. And our job as soul winners, as sowers, is critical to the kingdom of God. It is imperative. It is super important. There is no way around that. And so, like I said, there is an overwhelming agenda today to undermine this teaching, to undermine this doctrine, and we can't let it happen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, again, uh, for the truth that you bring to us week after week. Let's pray you bless our soul winning, Lord, like, uh, like you always have, Lord. And I, I just pray that uh, this year you'd also help to increase the disciples, Lord, that, we're, uh, that we would be able to, to preach to and to edify and to explain mysteries to you, Lord. Thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.